Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so, I'm going to be talking to you guys about kind of like my story about how we formed Hop Pop Factory, a little bit about how we started, and where we think all the technology that we're working with is going to be going. Um, just to let you guys know, there's some tags here, and you can find us at hoppopfactory.com. Um, what we do here in Toronto is a we are a multi, uh, multidisciplinary uh, firm, and we do design, but we also do fabrication. So not only do we think of uh, ideate the things that we're going to be making, we produce it, we manufacture it, um, and we kind of have like an urban factory that's located in downtown Toronto where all of our tools live, all of our machines live, and amongst all of those machines, we're also designing products and uh, different cool materials and all kinds of different experiences. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So my story actually begins in Rome. Um, I studied architecture and uh, spent quite a lot of time there. Um, Rome itself is kind of a, a funny place, um, funny for me when I was there because it has so much history. Um, there's layers and layers of history, actually, cities buried under cities, you know, over, over many, many, many years. Um, but at the surface of it, it's, it's a metropolis, you know, there's people buzzing in and out all the time, um, really cool things happening in the startup scene there as well. Um, and when I was there, I felt like, you know, Rome was kind of schizophrenic, uh, stuck between history um, and the future. So as an architecture student, when we were there and uh, given the task to design a museum in the hub of the city, right in front of the Termini train station, where, you know, it's, it's basically the gateway to the city. People are coming in and out all the time, um, but there's museums, you know, across the street with ancient artifacts, but also like really fancy shops, you know, over to the east. Um, so it was this real um, kind of conflict of many different people, many different types of infrastructure and lots of different uh, information colliding. So trying to determine what forms actually happen at this kind of intersection was, I thought, a huge task. Um, something that involved a lot of thinking. Um, and what I kind of came up with was, I thought, you know, this building really had to catch up to all the stuff that was happening around it, you know. And maybe it really isn't a building, it's not a pile of bricks, but maybe it's alive. Maybe it's programmed, maybe it's a robot. I don't know, why not? I was in school and nobody was going to tell me I couldn't do something. Um, so we actually came up with this crazy spider-looking prototype. You're like, this is not a building. And, I, and you know, all of my profs were like, this is not a building. <laughs> um, but what was proposed was basically an architecture where um, a wall can be a roof and a floor can be a wall, um, where windows can be transparent but also opaque uh, when the sun came out, for example. If you think of like a responsive website and how it responds to how people view it, we were thinking about buildings that responded to its environment uh, and the people who use it and the, and the things that happen inside the program. Um, so this was all um, pretty kind of fluffy stuff, I would say, in a pretty old industry like architecture uh, in the world of academia. It wasn't something that was met with a lot of welcome, I'd say, in my studies. Um, but at the time, I was thinking about a lot of different things, and I'll just throw a few terms out there for you now, because I'm going to be talking about them throughout the rest um, of the presentation. So number one is rapid prototyping. Has, do you guys want to like raise your hand if you know what that is? Cool. So rapid prototyping is a way to um, basically fabricate uh, prototypes. You know, car companies used it for years. Um, and they're all machines that um, are somewhat automated and take in computer-derived drawings or information um, to produce uh, prototypes very quickly. Um, and some of those technologies, and they're not limited to these, um, are 3D printing, laser cutting, laser engraving, CNC milling, and robot arming. Basically, any machine that is 
kind of robotic and understand computer, computerized language and can perform a task. Computational design, anybody? All right, I'll explain this one a little bit more. So this is a term that describes the process in which the instructions for these machines are going to be made. So the instructions, uh, they come in different forms. Uh, some of the things that you might have heard of is CAD design, so computer-aided design, 2D and 3D coding. Um, 3D scanning is another way of encapsulating information and translating them into instructions that the rapid prototyping machines can understand and perform. So what I'm going to be talking about really, um, it, it is robot arming that's in the, in the title, but really it comes down to di digital manufacturing. So it's, it's where the digital information that I was talking about gets translated into a manufacturing process and actually outputs physical things. So in a way, it's, you know, digital meeting physical. Um, and that, those thoughts were all the things that were in my mind, you know, when I was designing that crazy robot that was crawling around Rome. Um, because I imagined that the way that it would be designed is really coded, and the way that it would be made is through rapid prototyping equipment. So I'll show you some examples, um, but you're probably thinking this still sounds maybe a little bit aloof and, you know, why should I care about it, you know? Um, and I think what it all comes down to is the fact that with the digital prowess, the, the digital tools that we have, all of us, I think, in this room are pretty well versed. Um, imagine all the things that you're creating on your monitors can be translated into real physical products. Um, that is the kind of idea to real life phenomenon that I went to architecture school for. It's this amazing feeling that you can create something and it becomes real. Um, and I think what that is going to become is this whole movement called mass customization. So while all of our goods now are mass produced, I think a lot of these tools will allow us to customize the things that live in our physical world. So why should you care? Well, number one, I think it's really magical. Like all devs and all people who know how to code, I think understand the fact that you can write a few lines and see something happen. That feeling is really magical. So imagine if you can do that uh, in real life with physical things. So after, after my robot building, I decided to go to work because I needed to pay off some student loans. Um, and at that time, when I went into the workforce, you know, I wasn't all ready to go ahead and actually design robot buildings because that is still a little bit uh, theoretical. But I was able to use these philosophies, these thoughts that I was thinking about, to design buildings that were a lot more uh, responsive, a lot more fluid, um, that had this softer feel to them. And the computational design method that we employed was very much based on um, a parameter-based process. So the way that you would write lines of code to write rules for a program, well, I did that for form, too. Um, so here you're seeing a little kind of animation of the veil of the stadium in the last picture being designed. So instead of drawing lines explicitly like you would an illustrator or something, I'm actually putting down rules, so saying that this is a form that's derived of these ribs, and I'm going to subdivide these ribs into so many sections, and each of those sections can have a certain dimension. And what you see on the right side of the screen is actually the code, um, and all of the processes are codified um, based on these parameters so that I could drag a slider or change a line of it to actually update the form. So um, this process, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people in the industry aren't using, um, but uh, even though that this whole design was completely different, I mean, if you've ever looked at a wooden building, it's composed of lumber, and lumber comes in dimensions, you know, there's two by fours and two by eights. Nothing in this building was a standard size, so none of the parts were actually off the shelf. So that meant the entire building was custom. And something like that, most clients will kind of turn their nose and be like, no way, I'm not paying for this, you know? Um, but it's something that 
um, is possible today. So number one, the, the digital tool that I was using before, it's called Grasshopper. Um, that tool allowed me to design something really complex um, and make it possible in a really short amount of time. Um, and it also allowed me to translate that information to rapid prototyping machines like this CNC router here. This is a five axis machine. And this is the machine that fabricated each and every single one of those wooden members in the building that we saw. Um, and basically, it's a robot arm controlling a drill bit, and it's going around and sculpting out a pretty complex shape here. So all the information that came from my drawings earlier, my sketches earlier, gets translated to the machine, and it basically does the work for me. No labor is really involved, so this is a very different way of, uh, of building and constructing. Um, and the way that customization can be feasible is kind of like by taking all the man hours out of a project and letting the machines do the work. So while the process is more expensive, you're making savings somewhere else. So while, you know, back in school I was proposing robotic buildings that never would have happened, this is a building that is actually constructed. So um, this is the now TD uh, stadium in uh, Ottawa, and it's just right on the, on the river there. Um, and here it is kind of all coming together. So basically you'll see, so each and every single one of these members are custom sized and uh, put in place. Um, here is a partially completed photograph of the finished stadium. It's finished now, so um, if you Google Lansdowne Stadium, you'll get to see some photo finished photos of it. Cool, so another reason why I think you guys should care about rapid prototyping is that it's scalable. So I didn't stay in architecture. Um, buildings like the one I just showed you doesn't come along often. Uh, the timelines for completing a project like that is really long. Um, so when 3D printing became accessible through hobbyist printers like MakerBot, uh, I kind of jumped on the opportunity to try it out. So that was probably about four years ago. Um, at the time, we were using 3D printing to make scaled models, prototypes. Um, but why not use that technology to actually make products? Let's scale that operation of the building down to something that you can maybe wear. So we actually used the same process, the same design and fabrication process, and uh, designed a line of jewelry. So here you're seeing a spread of earrings that are all 3D printed. And the design process that went into uh, that went into all the jewelry pieces are done in the exact same software that I showed you before for the building. Um, here the rules are, you know, a ear, an earring is a certain size, and the parameters have to do with geometry. So we're playing with circles, triangles, and squares. Um, but the free kind of customizable part of it was the orientation of each of those parts. So from there, we were actually able to output designs from lines of code, um, and it gave us infinite options. So instead of drawing something that we felt was beautiful, we could actually output like a thousand versions of this concept and kind of go through them and curate the pieces that we liked, and those were the ones that we fabricated. Here's some photographs of the finished product on some marketing material. And I'll just show you a quick video of what the 3D printing process looks like. So this is SLS 3D printing. So if any of you have seen the MakerBot uh, 3D printing process, this is a little different. Um, this is higher resolution and uh, it is powder based. So you'll see that a layer of powder was just laid on and a, a high temperature, high precision laser is going around and sintering the material um, in the pattern that you tell it to. And after one layer is done, another layer of loose powder goes on, parts of it get sintered, um, and the end result is actually your form being embedded in like this big cube of powder, which is acting as a support material for the actual form. And um, the process is actually pretty cool. Like when your piece is done, you have to kind of excavate it like an archeologist um, and dig it kind of out of this uh, big mass of powder. 
So number three reason why it's cool is that it's sustainable. Um, the way that it was sustainable for us as a young business, so we were designing and distributing this jewelry, and uh, we made it so that every single piece that was delivered um, was completely unique. So each one had its own kind of unique fingerprint, if you will. The overall concept was laid down by us, but the program would output each an individual order for our customers. And what we actually did was put renders, so digital, digitally produced renders of the products on our e-commerce website and actually make the pieces after we received an order. So because with rapid prototyping, um, you're making things one at a time, the instructions get sent individually, um, we didn't have to keep inventory ever. So as a small business, um, it was a huge advantage. So, and it was also this like wonderful way of testing new ideas. Because you never have to invest in building the actual product physically, um, you could try out wild ideas and just see you know, what the response is. So we did a lot of things like that, like A-B testing and putting up uh, new ideas to see what the feedback was. And because we never had to keep inventory, it was a very lean operation. And I think at the time, like, um, I never thought of uh, hardware or like making products as lean um, because you have to invest in a lot in making physical things. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without 3D printing at the time for us. Um, another fantastic thing that allowed us to really get off the ground was the fact that we worked with our machines. So uh, as designers, it was fantastic. Um, I don't think I ever had the opportunity to have an idea and see it realized within minutes. Um, so what we did was actually tweak a design, get it printed, take a look at it 20 minutes later, and be able to make an iteration uh, really, really quickly. So what you're seeing here is like a prototype board of one single idea iterated through many, many, many different uh, permutations. permutations. So here is some marketing material. You saw little bits and pieces of it earlier. Um, another thing that we kind of took advantage of was actually using the code and using that um, really lean workflow for making our graphics as well. So we created little programs to output, um, output these really interesting tessellated images. Um, so instead of um, explicitly saying this is my art direction and making image after image, we actually built a system so that we can always input uh, a photograph, like just a regular photograph, and the code itself would translate it into an image like this. So we even automated other workflows within, you know, the, um, the process of releasing a product all the way down to um, the actual artwork and marketing material. And things like this, because we did it all kind of together in tandem really quickly, um, the process went really quickly, and we were able to get noticed for all of that work. Um, I think with new processes, you inevitably come up with completely new aesthetics. Um, so the aesthetic that comes with coating jewelry, well, it kind of came out looking pretty geometric. Um, and then taking that language and putting it into the artwork made a pretty cohesive package that um, tended to be pretty publishable as well. So all of those efforts were, you know, a part of what got us where we are now. And I touched on this earlier. It's very empowering. Um, all of this uh, I did probably two years ago with my partner, Matt, and we started out with one MakerBot on our dining room table. Um, and we were doing it as a side project. We still had full-time jobs as architects at the time, and it was something that just kind of grew organically by itself. Um, we didn't have to work with any external parties or suppliers. The only people we had to depend on was probably FedEx to ship our products to our uh, customers. But other than that, we actually produced a line of products within like a month and had people using it and buying it right away. And I don't think this is something that I could have done or people like me could have done, people who just came out of school, who had worked only a little bit, putting in very little capital. Um, so I would say over, you know, a lot of the benefits, it's truly inspiring. And um, this is the kind of thing that I think we're still propagating into our work. Um, and I'll show you a practical example of how empowering it was. So here's another project. 
Um, you guys know the Eameses, I assume? Yes, the designers and the mid-century designers who uh, created the Eames chair. So this saddle here is a saddle of a chair, very iconic chair. Um, and what we did was actually work with the Textile Museum of Canada, and we had one of these chairs, and we 3D scanned it. So what we did in this process was actually take something that already lived in the physical world and bring it into the digital world. And once you do that, you have total freedom. So that freedom that comes from working digitally is what empowered us here. So we're using the same program here, Grasshopper, and we're deriving some rules. The rules here are the chair saddles had to fit within these two curves. Pretty simple. Um, and we were able to extract elements from this linear form and be able to fabricate completely uniquely sized parts. So again, this is something that wouldn't really be feasible or practical in any other manufacturing method um, to do things that are total one-offs, basically. So we had all of these little chair saddles that we basically reduced in size, and we're printing it out on a MakerBot here. That was a time lapse. I wish it happened this fast. So we made hundreds and hundreds of these parts. So it was kind of cool. We kind of cloned this iconic you know, piece of furniture, this uh, great example of industrial design, and cloned it digitally, and then kind of manipulated it to become something totally different. We were inspired by the spine here. And because everything is kind of like generated, it has this kind of mathematical relationship with itself, um, all the pieces were actually able to self-assemble. Um, and this was the final piece. We auctioned it off. It could be worn as a necklace. It could sit as a sculpture, something pretty abstract. Um, but what was cool was um, we were able to remix a physical product like a DJ would remix a song. And I think that's really cool. Um, the fact that things can live in a physical space. And I think physical products have been monopolized over forever. Um, and the fact that now they're becoming this like free playground for us to pluck and kind of play around with, tweak, um, make our own, and then kind of propagate it back into the physical world is something that we were really interested in here. Got us some attention from William Gibson. That was one of the highlights. So um, a lot of people kind of like look at our work, and, and I think with 3D printing in the media and being pretty mainstream by now, um, a lot of people who aren't familiar with the technology are really fascinated and they really resonate with the fact that they can kind of peer behind the velvet curtain and see how something is made. Um, but not a lot of people really have the technical skill set to actually do something like this. Um, I think everyone can probably purchase a 3D printer. Some of you may have already experienced this, but you know, you just kind of end up printing out tchotchkes and things like that, right? It's um, creating the content for 3D printing is something that's still pretty limited. Um, it's something that kind of I had the right skill sets for, um, it just so happened, but I think that that doesn't have to be the case. Um, so all the software that gets used um, to do this work, all the computational design tools are totally, like the learning curve on those things are crazy. Um, it's not something I would recommend to like an eight-year-old who's really, really psyched about 3D printing. Um, but I think there are things that are coming out, um, lots of people working on interactive, really intuitive tools for people to create 3D printable designs. And that's something that we're really interested in as well. So what we're thinking is, you know, what if something as simple as finger, print, uh, finger painting can be translated into physical products, you know? So in this little uh, installation here, we played with the leap motion, um, a gesture control, sensor and decided, hey, what if kids can just kind of wave their fingers around um, and, you know, people of all ages who have no idea what rapid prototyping or computational design is, what if they can just kind of wave their hand and start creating artwork? 
um, creating really fun things that can be translated into physical form. That magic I was talking about earlier, we totally experienced it. It was totally cool to like say, hey, you made something, and uh, a few hours later, you get to hold it in your hand. So tools like this, I think, are really key in what's going to push all of this forward. Um, because while the, the manufacturing kind of tools and machines are developing and people are learning more and more about them, there's this kind of like lack of skill set from a lot of people um, who are interested but don't know how to create content. Um, so what I think it should become is probably like these customization tools rather than design tools. Um, if I were to think of it in the context of everyone. Um, and just kind of harping back onto the products that we designed, the jewelry that we designed, there were elements that, you know, I think that the consumer in the end could probably participate in, um, but not have to completely take over. So here's a little proposal um, that we made for a product. So what you're seeing here, this is the Vega Edge project. Have any of you guys heard of it? It's a local Toronto Kickstarter. Um, and clients of ours are uh, Angela McKee and Kate Hartman of OCAD. Um, and basically, it's a bike light. It's a fashionable bike light. It's made out of leather. It's got magnetic kind of closures on it, so you can clip it onto the edge of your clothing. I thought it was a pretty cool idea. Um, but we actually worked with these guys to kind of design a customization interface. So kind of making the, the kind of designing process something that was made of like really simple swatches that you can click on, um, really intuitive, simple gestures that you can make in the browser and allow anyone uh, with no experience in doing this kind of thing to just start to customize the actual final product. So for us, as the people who are designing this interface, what we did was actually made sure that all the information that gets input from the website um, actually become the CAD drawings that our, that our machines understand. Um, so whatever information we're getting from our user um, is actual CAD drawings, like die lines of the pattern that the leather needs to be cut out in. And, you know, if they put their name on it, if they personalize in some way, all that information is captured, and I could send that directly to my machines. So that basically cuts out, like, a ton of different steps in between. Um, there's no designer translating the information. There's no technician loading it to the machine. Um, everything we're kind of building in this automated workflow. So in the end, we actually produced 500 units of this Kickstarter campaign, and uh, the final, the final pieces were basically kind of little leather cutouts that got sent to a seamstress who sewed the whole thing together. But I feel like later on in the future, there'll be robot arms kind of sewing everything together. So here's some photos. So this isn't like a new idea. There's big companies doing this all over the place, and I really do think that it's on the horizon. Um, retail is hungry for this injection of, you know, omni-channel and people consuming goods differently and the, um, the kind of participatory nature um, that I think all of us kind of have now um, and have an appetite for is something that can be satiated. So Nike ID has been doing this. I don't know if you guys have seen this coat campaign where your name uh, or they printed out, you know, personalized uh, labels for their bottles. And even just like art projects like this, imagine, you know, products that are totally whack and, and customized to you. Or um, for the ladies out there, imagine if you could have a mascara wand that perfectly fits your hand and your grasp so that it was an ergonomic piece. Um, so all of this personal information can be fed into the products. And I don't think that process is... Uh, infeasible. It's actually feasible, I think, in the very near future. And then I guess the last point, um, and I think our company is a great example, um, all of these technologies, the uh, computational design, the 
uh, rapid prototyping, all of the technology that we use makes you really agile. And um, I, I think like back when I was in architecture school, I hadn't heard of people talking about like products as agile. You heard about it, you know, for, for startups who are doing software because code is agile. You can be a very agile company if you're just doing software. But um, I think it can start to be the case for physical products and how physical things are made as well. Um, here's an example. Um, so I know some of you guys are from out of town, but for us local people here, um, the cool thing that, well not the cool thing, the, the crazy news that was here last year was this guy, uh, our mayor. And uh, there were tons of memes everywhere when the news broke um, about his personal habits. Um, and memes travel fast, right, in the digital world, in the world of the internet. Um, but what we wanted to do was actually develop a product that could be a meme and develop it as fast as the, as the internet memes were coming out. And that's something, that, that agility, that speed, um, is only possible with the tools that I was just talking about. So what we did was go on the internet and scavenge some beautiful photos of the man, and uh, we were able to create his likeness without his permission, and create like a physical product. <laughs> and uh, basically we did this whole exercise, we made like a whole package, you know, it was like a gift. Uh, we sent it out to all of our clients for Christmas as a present and sent it to a few like publications around town, people who cared about this kind of story. Um, we were able to personalize a lot of the gifts as well. Um, so this particular artifact um, is it, done in 3D printed sandstone. It has this kind of nice ceramic feel. Um, for those who are wondering, it doesn't actually function. I don't know anything about designing crack pipes. Uh, I think I like just found an image and copied it sort of. Um, but the cool thing about this whole thing was we actually made a viable, like, physical product within about, I think we did it in, like, two weeks, you know, from just, like, grabbing the photo off the internet and, like, getting our 3D print finished. We did a run of 30 of them. You can never make 30 of anything, like, without this technology, you know. Um, so doing short runs and doing, like, really special projects like this um, was perfect for this technology. So other fun things that we've done, I mean, it really ranges. Like, we've done lots and lots of artwork. This is a totally laser-cut project with uh, algorithmic color kind of treatment over the whole thing. This is a cardboard beehive. Um, it's this cool kind of internal shape, and uh, the artist that we worked with doused it with hormones and dripped all kinds of like beeswax on it, and bees ended up inhabiting it over a couple of weeks. It lived in the brickworks garden for a few months. Uh, another bee project, but this is a, a beehive for humans. It was a conceptual piece that was displayed in the ROM. So now you're seeing something that's a bigger scale, um, but also done with similar technology. Um, a lot of things that are digitally fabricated come as a kit of parts, and, and they kind of come together, sort of like your IKEA furniture. Here is a prototype of a hardware project. Uh, they are called Wattage. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Peter spoke earlier today. Um, these guys are working on a customizable electronics enclosure for DIYers and makers. Um, and we were able to do a 3D printed prototype as well as a laser cut prototype. Um, and just like going through the process like super fast, testing out ideas, making like for real presentable prototypes, put them in front of people really quickly. So that agility that I was talking about um, can work at all different phases of a business. When you're testing something out, when you're presenting it, all the way to when you're shipping it. I think it's actually possible. And that's it. So I'm totally down for questions if you guys have any. In the back there. I do, yeah. Um, programmatically, there was something, there's like program right behind it for light 
to actually penetrate a part of the building. So, you know, apertures in the facade were, were utilized as a language for multiple kind of applications. So apertures can be doorways, they can be uh, gathering spaces on the interior. You know, if the facade opened out, then there's this kind of uh, like a bay window that was happening on the interior, um, or it could be a window. Um, so there's various different kind of program that allowed us to dictate what the outside form looked like. I see one in the hallway there. Or yeah, in the corridor, that's not a hallway. Would what have? Okay, so the question was what kind of environmental implications uh, are there um, in this type of manufacturing process? Um, I would say that question is, so right now at this stage in, in this uh, technology, um, the, the environmental impacts are nowhere near the environmental impacts of traditional manufacturing processes. I mean, that stuff is intense. Um, and I think that right at this moment, there's not the kind of volume that's going into this type of work that actually produces anything significant, anything to note. Um, I don't know about the future. There's lots of cool things happening uh, in terms of like recycling material. Um, you know, like if you print something, you can melt it and use that material again. I think a lot of those um, concepts can be valid in the future, but I don't think there's um, a sig significant kind of need for them. I think they're like these great ideas right now, but um, I don't think these processes are happening at scale at all for us to be worried about yet. Okay, so the question was minimums uh, and the fact that uh, rapid prototyping allows us to do small quantities, um, but the question is, does it cost an arm and a leg, right? Is that what you're asking? Um, it doesn't cost an arm and a leg now. It is more expensive than traditional means. Um, for us, we don't compete with things that are made in China. Um, that are made abroad. Um, those things, typically when you're uh, manufacturing something, if you're going over 5,000 units, that's when it becomes cost uh, efficient to do it overseas because you have a volume. Anything under that, you're not going that route. So I think when you're talking about cost, you also have to talk about the scope of the project, uh, what's required. Because if you need 20 things and you try to do it in traditional means, it's gonna be way more expensive uh, than using some of these tools. Uh, if you're making a hundred things, then you might want to do a few kind of like pros and con lists. Um, but most of the things that we encounter are quite specific. Um, but I'm operating a business using all of these tools right now, and I have a bootstrap sustainable business. Um, so the costs aren't crazy that I don't have any clients. I don't think I see any more. Um, so the question was about what kind of substrates um, that you can use with digital fabrication tools. Um, 3D printing right now is pretty limited. You're limited to a lot of different plastics. You can do metals, but the objects has to be really small, about the size of a fist. Um, you could do cool things like 3D print in wax and make molds that are castable. Um, you can do like fun glow-in-the-dark stuff. Um, you could do sandstone, which is nice. Ceramic just got discontinued. Um, so there's a few materials, but uh, there's nothing that allows you to do multiple materials at the same time. So that's one big aspect that I think is missing from the landscape and everybody is yearning for. Like a billion businesses will pop up once that happens. Um, and a billion businesses will benefit when that technology becomes available. Um, in terms of subtractive methods, so what I was 3D printing is additive. Uh, CNCing and laser cutting is subtractive. Now, when you're subtracting material, you're taking material that already exists and basically sculpting it or cutting it. So that opens you up to way more variety. Um, you can work with woods, you can work with plastics, you can work with textiles, like I was showing you, leather, cottons. 
Um, so when we're working in those mediums, our clients are really diverse. We're working with fashion designers, uh, we're working with industrial designers, we're working with toy makers. Um, it gets really, really fun, I think, when we're working in those mediums. So I think there's a lot of variety and um, we tend to know like how to point someone in the right direction um, depending on their scope. Y'all cool? You know everything you want to know? I can't really see with the light. So are there are there hands in the back, I think? Nope. <laughs> All right, well, I guess that wraps things up.